The dark can be a bit scary. Things that are unknown. Things that are unseen. The world can seem like a dark place sometimes. Sadness. Even the smallest light can make you feel better. The Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. His bright presence with us makes us happy. When Jesus lives in our hearts, we become little lights in the world too. So shine your light through every smile, every good deed, every act of love. Make the world a little brighter. Well, good morning, guys. I'm so glad to see you here. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay, okay. We got my mom in the front, Harold. Good job, good job. All right. Well, you guys being here today is going to feed your soul. That's what, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to be together and with the Lord is to let the Lord fill us, right? <clears throat> so when you're connecting with other believers and you're listening to a powerful message and worshiping Lord with all your heart, that's what it's about, right? And, and don't just do that here. Make time during your week to do that. Um, so today, what, I, what we want to do is to helpful, help you have a great church experience. So we've created a program uh, to help you get involved, to stay informed, and to take these next steps in following Jesus. So what you're going to do is you're going to get your, uh, your tear. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You're going to uh, tear our portion. So we ask everyone to fill out today the information in that, in that tear out form and turn it in to the resource table. Um, uh, by the end of the service. And if you're a newcomer, we do have our victory tumblers there in the back, and it's our way of us saying thank you for being here. Go ahead and turn in your response form at the resource table, and you'll get your tumbler. So for announcements, like we say just about every week, join a group. If you're not part of a small group, go ahead and join one. We have some for men, for women, for kids, for young adults, for youth. Join up and, uh, you know, just live life with other believers. Um, definitely, you guys need to check in on our Monday morning lives. Our pastor Dave does every morning at, or every Monday morning at 8 a.m. He starts the work week, um, gets you off started right, and just a time to worship God and, and just to think about things and get going at 8 a.m. That's live on Facebook. Um, it's about 15 minutes, and uh, we'd love for you guys to go ahead and join him there. And next, um, we're gonna do. We're gonna come back next for our series, Sojourners and Exiles. We are going through the book of First Peter, and this is a training manual to uh, for being a Christian in today's world. Lots of practical help to live faith, uh, live out your faith in God. And so, right now, what I want you to do is kind of let your arms hang a little bit, let your feet hang off the chair, wiggle them around, get loose. Take a deep breath, prepare your hearts right now as the worship team leads us and we worship our God. All right, let's all rise as we worship the Lord and praise the Lord that we are serving a living Savior. Amen. Says one who is my 
Good morning, church. You know, uh, we are all guilty of sin in some manner, whether it's small or big. We're all guilty of it. And many times we become ashamed and try to hide it within ourselves. Even though our hands are dirty and we try to hide it, We have a loving God that when we plead our cause, our wrongdoing, he will forgive us. He will forgive us and and break those bondage of sin. So how can it be that a God so loving, so caring, will forgive us and release us from the bondage of sin? Well, way back in the 20th century, Noel Cowell, uh, a well-known British playwright and act, uh, comedian, decided to play a prank on 10 famous men in London. And he sent each of these 
distinguished men the same note. And the note read, we know what you have done. If you don't want to be exposed, leave town. Now he didn't know if they did anything wrong or right. But within six months, all 10 men moved out of London. You know, guilt's a powerful emotion. It holds us captive, excludes us from sharing the intimate relationship we have with our God. Even though it was a prank, his note exposed the guilt that each one was hiding. And the fear of exposure caused them to move out of town to hide their sin. The guilt and shame becomes a self-made prison that excludes us from entering the joy of God's presence. So what's the key to open the door of God's presence and unlocking the chains of guilt? You may be surprised, but the key to freedom of guilt is guilt. Now that doesn't make sense, but if you look at each letter of guilt, G-U-I-L-T, and whenever you feel that guilt, remind yourself of those letters. You see, G means go to God first. U means uncover your sin. I means I am the center of the guilt. It's a battle within us. L, let go of the past. And T, thank God for his promises. So how can it be that our God can forgive us? Because he died on the cross, rose again, and he still lives to this day that we could count on him to forgive us. Amen? Amen. So let's continue singing. How can it be?
Thanks so much, worship team. Very good. The Lord is good. How are you guys today? You guys doing all right? Okay. Will you join me in prayer as we get started with this message? God, I just thank you that we could gather together on this, on this cool day. I pray you, praise you, God, and I pray that we would, as we gather, Lord, we would honor you. As your people, we're here because we love you. We're here because we want to be together. We want to worship you together, Jesus, online and in person. I thank you for the opportunity to come, to be here together with each other. I pray, Lord, that we would walk away blessed because we're open. Lord, I pray that we would walk away filled because we need your filling, Lord, with your word. Lord, I pray that we would be your people in the way we live, in the way we act, in the way we speak, in the way we work, in the way we parent, in the way we love. I pray, God, that we would get a vision for that right now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I just want to give you a glimpse back into my past. So I love telling stories about myself from my history because it reminds me of how far I've come in Christ. And, and so I think every one of God's people should love telling stories about who they used to be and, and who they are today and what God has done in their lives. Because that's one of the ways that we witness to his greatness by the transformation that has taken place in our lives. And um, when one of the thoughts that... that I had as, as I was preparing this message is remembering what I was like in high school. And um, there was a day that, that I made a decision to break from who I was. I was, I was a kid, grew up in Buena Park, and, and I started smoking pot, was my first drug at 11 years old. I was a sixth grader at Raymond, Tel Raymond Temple Elementary School, and I started smoking pot with older kids that lived in my neighborhood over in the sand track of Buena Park near there. And, and um, I was going to church, and I was going to church every week, but that didn't affect how I lived any part of my life. Going to church made zero difference on any part of my life. It didn't affect... The kind of son I was, going to church didn't affect the kind of brother I was, going to church didn't affect how I did in school, the kind of friend I was, it had zero impact. Why? Because I didn't let it. I didn't let it have any impact on me. And there was a day when I was in high school that I said, you know what, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to live for God. And something happened in my life that, that drew me to God, some, some way that the Lord got my attention. And it was multiple ways. It was through a youth pastor who cared and showed interest in me. It was, it was through, um, I, I learned, I was into heavy metal music, and then there was, there was, I, I got a hold of Christian rock and was like, oh, there's Christian heavy metal music. And, and, and started listening like, oh, that's like they're speaking my language and they're talking about Jesus. 
oh, that's kind of cool. And I went to this, this, this group that was becoming famous here in Orange County. They were called Striper, and, and they, they were a Christian rock group, and they had their theme verse, Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes, we are healed, and the kind of stripes were, their, were their, their thing. So all their guitars were black and yellow stripes and their outfits and, and everything like that, and they had these long hair and this loud music, and it was like, oh, that got my attention. And I started going like, okay, you can, you can be yourself and still love Jesus. I like that. And, and so um, I remember at one of their concerts, it was at Knott's Berry Farm. And, and the, the, what's the big theater at Knott's Berry Farm? Whatever the big theater is, they were playing in that, in that theater. The bird, is, what's it called? Birdcage. The Birdcage Theater. Okay, the biggest one that they have there, the indoor. I, just, I couldn't remember the name, but okay, the Birdcage Theater. And, and I remember being, being like in the, in the first few rows of that concert, and, and they would throw out these little pocket New Testament. They, they, they'd come out with stacks of them, and it had a little, a little, the only difference between it and any other Bible was it had a little sticker on the cover of the band, Striper. And so they're throwing these things out. They come out, and they're like, pop, 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 pop. They're just throwing tons of them out. And all these kids are like trying to catch a Bible. And, 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 and I caught one one time. I caught one. And it was like, okay, I've got a striper Bible. Very cool. It was my little pocket New Testament. And I started carrying around that Bible with me. It was, in my, it was literally in my pocket everywhere I went. And I would, wherever I, I would be, and I had a few minutes, I would just pull it out of my pocket, and I would read the Word of God wherever I was. And there was a day that I said, okay, I'm going to live for God all the time. And I remember there was that something started happening to my friends because I didn't say like, oh, well, I'm not going to hang out with my friends. I would go be with my, my same friends. And so, you know, at school, going hanging out with friends. And, and then as I started talking about God and, and they'd see me carrying around my Bible or see me like between classes pulling out my Bible and start reading... And then people would start to think of me different. And I noticed it because there were, people would start going, they would start dropping F-bombs and cussing, and they'd be like, oh, sorry, Dave. And people would say, I, I noticed people started doing that. When I gave my life to God, all of my friends started adjusting themselves to me. It was really interesting. I'd even go, like, I had some friends around the corner that, wait, I'd go to their house, and they would always have pot, and we would smoke pot, you know, after school every day, and I was like, I still went to their house, and then I'd be like, nah, no thanks, I'm good, and they, they'd be like, okay, and they're smoking pot, and we're hanging out, playing our guitars, and then they would, they would, they would still, when they start cussing, they'd be like, oh, sorry, Dave, sorry, Dave, you know, <laughs> it's funny. People adjusted their life to me, and when I noticed that, I thought that was a fascinating thing. As I look back on that, I can see where that was happening more and more. And it's like my life represented something different than it had represented in the past. And because all of my friends noticed it, they started adjusting their behavior to me. And I didn't ask them. I'd be like, it's all right. It's all good. And, but they adjusted themselves to me. And then eventually I was like, you know what? I don't want to go hang out and smell like pot. And I started getting different friends and changing the way I lived. And, and, and that happens with time. Well, I think that what happened with me, my life was pointing towards something. My life was pointing toward Jesus because everything about my life began to represent Jesus. I was a, a high school student at Kennedy High School in La Palma when I made that decision, when I made those changes. And, uh, and from that day forward, I said, my life belongs to you, God. And I look at that, and I think of that Christians are supposed to represent something. Our lives are supposed to point towards something. And so I call this message, arrows pointing toward heaven, because our lives are like arrows, and those arrows are pointing towards something. Whatever, whatever your, your life is mainly about, that's what you're the arrow pointing toward, but Christians are meant to be arrows pointing toward heaven. 
with our lives. And, 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 and like as me as a, as a kid, as a teenager that made a choice to say, I'm going to represent something different. I praise God because that decision saved my life. I believe that decision saved my life. I believe I see where some of my friends who I hung out with back then, where their lives wound up. And, and I go, they were my friends. I traveled in those circles. Some of those people are not even alive anymore. And I thank God some of those people went to jail, prison. Those people had broken marriages. They, 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 they broken families. They left a trail of brokenness, of devastation. And I was on that track. And I thank God that he did, he somehow, he used a youth pastor and Christian rock music to get my attention. And um, so this message, arrows pointing toward heaven, is an invitation for Christians to be followers of Jesus in every part of our lives. And I'm going to read to you from the scriptures. I'm going to go ahead and read starting from um, 2 Peter. This is part of our series called Sojourners and Exiles. I'm going to read 2 Peter, or excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1 um, and, and verses 18 through 21 to get us started. This first part of the message I call witness. Witness, starting at verse 18. Sorry, chapter 2 and verse 18. All right. Servants, Peter says, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the, to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Verse 19, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. All right, so this first part is witness. Peter is giving us a, some... some some uh, instruction about how to live. Peter's calling on believers to be aware of the way we live and that their actions speak something very loudly about what they believe. So Peter's saying, believers in God, believers in Jesus, your actions matter. So be careful how you live. This section is a call for Christians to testify about Jesus with the way that we live our lives. So in verse 18, when, when Peter says, be subject to your masters with all respect. So he's speaking and he, he's addressing people in his day who were servants. Uh, they were in the role of servants in that day. Um, those, those could be workers, but they could also be indentured servants, um, what we would call slaves, not quite what we think of as American slaves, but with more freedom than that. But it was a form of slavery for sure. But he's speaking to servants and he's going, anyone that you're sub subject to, whether they're a good master or a terrible master, he's saying to them, be subject to them with respect. Use every form of respect to everyone that you answer to is what Peter is saying to them. And so in our day, what masters do we have? What masters do we have in our lives? Our bosses are our master in some way. In the same way Peter's talking about here, you can think of your, your boss uh, that way. You could also think of teachers that way. You could also think of your parents when you're a kid in that way. And he says, with all respect, be subject to them. Whether they're good um, or, or, or unjust, it doesn't matter. Be subject to them. Because if you have a good boss or a bad boss, if, you, if your teacher's a maniac or a saint, if you have amazing parents or dreadful parents, it doesn't matter. Be subject to them with all respect is what Peter's calling Christians to live in such a way that we have respect toward all outsiders, so all people who we, who we answer to. And in, in, it's often the case that where people who are supposed to care for us 
are the ones who hurt us. So when parents abuse their, their children, then, okay, that's a terrible parent. But Peter's saying to those kids, still be subject with respect to your parents. And, but in all cases, your behavior is a reflection of your faith in Jesus, is what Peter is saying to us. So make sure we represent Jesus well, whether we're subject to good masters or bad ones. So when I think of, of application of what Peter is saying here, I think that Christians would do well to not take on the behavior of their worldly friends. There was a reason why I, I had to come to a day where I said, yeah, I'm going to stop coming over and hanging out with the guys where they're just smoking pot and playing their guitars. And I, I, it was like, people would look at me and they're like, oh, they thought I was still going over there to be the guy who was smoking pot with all the guys. And I wasn't. I was like, I, I never touched pot a day after that after I decided to, to follow Jesus. But I did hang around with a lot of friends. All my friends, almost all of my friends, I would say, smoked pot and did drugs. And like the gap became, became wider and wider the longer I said, no, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. And people still thought I was the same guy because I looked the same. I still had long hair. Back when I had, yeah, there was a day when I had hair a century ago. It was for sure. That day used to be real. Had hair halfway down my back and wore, wore an earring. And, and, and people thought I was still the same guy. But inside, positionally, before I was dead, spiritually dead, now I was alive. And what was important to me was quickly changing very fast, very fast. And that's my grandson. He's saying amen when I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, little David. I hear you, buddy. I see you. <laughs> so, with all respect, Peter's calling us to, to be mindful of how we, we interact with others. So, for example, don't cuss out someone who annoys you. Don't be that person. Or don't chew them out, for that matter. You know, Marcy and I were, last week, we were at the Lakewood Mall, and, and as we were driving in the parking lot to exit the mall, then some people were, were um, walking on the parking lot to go ahead and, and um, get to their car. It was a guy and a girl, and they were um, just horsing around. And he was probably, I don't know, I'm guessing late 20s was um, this guy. And, and they were horsing around, and they were kind of stopping traffic. Like, we're all waiting. Like, there's a lot of people, you know, exiting the mall, and we're all waiting. And this guy was... You know, we're right there, and we're just watching this guy horse around with his girlfriend or whoever she was, and, like, we're, we're all just waiting for them to go. And then somebody honks at him, and, and, and the person who honks at him, they're like, you know, like that, like, what are you doing? And he looks over at that person, and he starts cussing her out, and it's like, F you, B, and he starts, he's like, like, calling her back to come fight him. It's like, Really? For real? But you see people do that every day if you're watching for it. All the time when you're driving, when you're just passing through somewhere, people are, are acting in, the, in this kind of manner all the time. They're like, like, a, like a, a, a short fuse where they just go off. And what set people off? But um, Whatever sets people off is different for everyone, but I would say this, that that example is just a micro example of, wow, that guy needs the Lord because Jesus brings out the best in people instead of the worst in people. Like, we saw the worst in that guy. We saw the worst in him in just in, in, in a minute. And I don't know, maybe he's having a terrible day, but is you having a terrible day any reason for, for you know, is that a, a good excuse to start, like, looking to fight people or, or, or take it out on people in, in, in such ways? No, not at all. But we're called to be different. That kind of behavior is an example of a man in need of Jesus. And we need Jesus because he brings out the best in us. This second section, I'm going to read, uh, or actually, I'm going I'm to stay right here. In verse 19, sorry, Peter, Peter um, says something about it's a gracious thing when, um, when we, we take on suffering behavior. When we just take it on, he says it's a gracious thing. And for this gracious thing to endure sorrows, 
um, while suffering unjustly, Peter says. Um, the word translated gracious thing, it speaks in two ways. One, about God's grace that's evidenced on us. And you think of God's grace on your life, and you can be thankful that God showed grace on you because you know um, I can look at my life and go, man, there's, there's so many times that I treated people poorly. I treated my family poorly. I treated my relatives poorly, my friends poorly, and I treated God poorly. I took God for granted. And, and, um, but God's grace, he didn't punish me for it. The Lord was gracious with me, and so I'm thankful for that grace that God gave. But um, So it reminds us, Peter saying, it's a gracious thing. When you receive sorrow and you endure it, it's a gracious thing. It, it, it's gracious because of God's grace, but it's also gracious. It, it's, it's a word that's, that's here and elsewhere can be translated as credit. It's a gracious thing. It's a credit to you. And, and what, what he means here is that when you endure suffering, when you endure sorrow, and you endure it, like unjust sorrow that's placed on you that you didn't deserve, terrible circumstances that are placed on you that you didn't deserve, but yet it happened to you, and you still endure it, and you keep your faith. You don't blow up on people. You, you endure it, and you trust God. It's a credit to you in God's eyes. It's a gracious act in God's eyes. It's a credit. God looks. He's watching you. He's seeing how we respond. And the Lord looks on that is what Peter's saying here is that's a credit in our account. Not to earn our salvation. We've already got salvation. But the Lord wants to recognize our good behavior and say, Grant, good job. And say, Donna, you're amazing. And say, Tino, way to go. The Lord is looking at us. And he's, he's recognizing our behavior and he's crediting our good behavior. And he rewards our good behavior. And so I wanted to point out that the gracious thing that Peter's talking about here is when you endure sorrow, the Lord rewards you, credits you, and honors you. And it, uh, moving on, Peter asked this question. He goes, for what credit is it if when you sin you and beaten for it, you endure? Okay, so you've sinned, you're beaten for it, but you still endure. Peter's going, well, it's different when we're not talking about that. Peter's talking about you didn't sin and you endure. If you sin and you get punished for it, that's normal. You would expect that. It's like when your child, your child does something bad. Gabby, when you were really little, if you did something bad, you stole something, would your parents punish you for it if you did something bad? They probably would, right? Ellen and Jim, you would punish her if she did something really bad, right? Yeah. And, and it's like when, when you do something bad, okay, you deserve punishment. You deserve punishment. And I always say, like, man, sometimes my kids really needed to be healed. David, you needed to be healed a lot when you were a little boy. You needed to be healed a lot. <laughs> It's a reality. Faye just asked me later on, I'll tell you about all the times I had to heal David. <laughs> but you, you, when you do something bad, you're punished for it. Peter says, well, that's no surprise. But God's people here, we endure suffering and we don't deserve it. That's what we're credited for. That's what the gracious act is. And have you ever heard of William Tyndale? Anybody ever heard of William Tyndale? He's not alive today. He's, he lived in the 16th century. And um, I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about William Tyndale. He was an Englishman, and he was the Englishman who first translated the Bible into English. He first translated the Bible into English in the 16th century. But there was great opposition to William Tyndale's work of translating the Bible into English. Up to then, people didn't have the Bible in their own language. People had to, it was only, it was really, really tight. It was only the Latin Vulgate. And the priest read from Latin, and the people listened in Latin, and then the priest told them what it means. 
So they would have to depend on the priest telling them what the Word of God says. Nobody had the Bible where they could just go home and take it with them or like pull it up on their phone. It was unheard of. And, and so this is in the 16th century. And so the, church, the Catholic Church and the Church of England were super opposed to William Tyndale and his work. They despised his work. When they found copy, a copy of the, the translated Bible into English, the church would burn it publicly. They would take the, and they would talk about it. They looked at English as a vulgar language that didn't deserve to have the Bible translated into the vernacular that the people spoke in. And, and so they, they would burn copies of the scripture. When they would find people who were reading Tyndale's scripture, copy translation of the scriptures, those people would be burned at the stake alive for reading the Bible in English. They would be captured and burned alive publicly in front of everyone for reading the Bible in English. And, and so William Tyndale, um, if I had more time, I would tell you there were five words in particular that the church despised about how William Tyndale translated these words from the Greek New Testament into English. And these, there were five words that the whole argument came down to because the way Tyndale translated these five words, it changed everything in church history. It, changed, it broke the power that the church had that controlled society and controlled people and their lives. And the church did it on purpose to control people. They had a, a strong like, hold on societies, entire societies, because of bad translations of the Bible. And I'll just tell you what, 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 what the words were, but I'm not going to go into them a whole lot, but I'll tell you what the words were. The first thing is that William Tyndale translated, instead of the, the word priest that they used um, they, for the word presbytos, they, he translated it as elder instead of priest. So what that did, the effect that that had was it broke this power of the priest where people going like, oh, the priest is the holy man and we have to go to the holy man. And it paved the way for within the church that we see from among us, there are those who we recognize as with leadership capabilities or the hand of God is on them and they become elders or leaders, but they're among us. I don't have any special powers that you don't have. I don't have any special insight to God that you don't have access to. I'm an elder in the church by those, by, by, by those translation, by that translation. I'm not, I don't, and, and in fact, we look at priesthood as we're all priests. If we're going to use the word priest, then we're all priests. The priesthood of every believer, because we all have access to God, and the holy man doesn't have any more access than us. The holy man doesn't have any more spiritual power or capacity than us. So Tyndale was a huge threat to the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church because he broke the power that they had over the people with his translation, his accurate translation of the Bible. Another word that, 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 that they, were, they despised Tyndale and they wanted to kill him for was because he translated, the word that they translated as church, he translated not as church, which meant building. They imported that word church, which actually comes from a German word, that means building. And instead, Tyndale translated as congregation. So now what Tyndale did is he broke the power of the church as saying that building is the sacred place where we go to worship God. And instead, to see ourselves as a holy people that we can worship God in our lives. The altar where we worship God is our hearts. And, and so see how Tyndale, his translation in simple words, just five words were everything of why the Catholic Church and the Church of England were so opposed to Tyndale and they burned copies of the English 
translation of the Bible. It's the first time the Bible was translated into any other language other than Latin at that point. And another word was they had translated this word as do penance. And Tyndale translated it as repent. Can you see what what changed? You can see what, how he broke another way that they had power over people. Oh, you sin? You go to the priest, the holy man, and the priest tells you by how bad your sin is what you have to do to earn God's favor, to do penance. Instead, Tyndale translated it as repentance, which is an accurate translation. And when he translated it as repentance, that led the, it took away the stronghold on Christians that the priest had to, to, to be the, the ones who absolve their sins. And the priest no longer had that power because with Tyndale translation, we saw that we could go to God ourselves and repent. Repentance is turning the other way. We could turn the other way and walk toward God. And, 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 and then another word that, that Tyndale translated that they didn't like was He translated the word that they used to say confess, and he used the word acknowledge. And and, and, um, this led to a dissolution of the practice of confessing their sins to the priest. So no longer was that even a relevant thing when people understood the uh, the Bible from an accurate perspective. Confessing your sin to the priest when you're like, I'll confess my sin straight to God. I'll, conf- I'll acknowledge my sin before God, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to the Lord. And the last word that they hated Tyndale for was the word that they translated charity, he translated as love. And the reason why they hated it is because the, the church in the medieval era had created this whole system where charity, acts of charity, became something that that the, those who had means would do in order to look good in front of the, the, the community and the town and in front of everyone who was watching. Every act of charity they did, it was to feed their reputation. It was to make themselves look good. It was to earn favor before people. It was to earn titles and position. And, and when, when Tyndale translated it as love, which was accurate... He took away the power of their system that they created of earning favor. Their system of looking good without being good. And instead, to to, to define love as love without seeking anything for oneself, love blesses, love protects, and love provides for. And so Tyndale was an important man in church history. Would you agree? Would you agree? Get to know William Tyndale. And, and so, um, William Tyndale, how was he rewarded for the great things that he did? Because entire societies became free. We are free from those kind of religious bounds, chains, because of Tyndale. God used William Tyndale. How do you think Tyndale was rewarded? For, for, for such great things. Yeah. Tyndale fled his country, his own country that he loved so much, that he translated the Bible into English for the people so they could be free. And, and, and he was passionate about translating the Bible into the vernacular of the people. And, and he fled the country, and they sent assassins to find him. And they found him. After years, they found him. It took him some years. He fled his homeland in 1524. He was burned at the stake in 1536, right when they found him. They brought him back to England as a prisoner, and they burned him at the stake on British soil. So back to Peter's question. For what does it credit us if when you sin, you're beaten for it and you endure? No credit at all. But when you do good and you... and and, and, and you're beaten for it. You're burned at the stake for it. God places a special honor for that kind of suffering that we endure. Tyndale didn't deserve that. But he, 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 in God's eyes, Peter's telling us, the Lord looks on that with a special favor. 
and, 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 and there's a reward that, that Tyndale receives in heaven from the Lord himself for that. Real quickly, this next section I call example. Peter answers his own question. He says this in verses 22 and 23. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Tyndale paid the ultimate price so that entire societies could be free, could break free from the grip of corrupt medieval, a corrupt medieval church. Tyndale pointed toward Christ. Tyndale was an arrow pointing toward heaven. No matter the price it cost him, he was an arrow pointing toward heaven because he was called to it. Peter tells us we're all called to this kind of life. We're called to be ready to, to, to sacrifice, to endure suffering, even though we don't deserve it, for doing what's right. Suffering for doing what's right, even though we don't deserve it. We are called to that kind of life, and we'll receive that kind of payment in this world because the world is antagonistic to Christ. See, even, even the church had become so corrupt, what started off so beautiful with the apostles had become so corrupt and become this huge thing, but it had become so corrupt and so deluded and so perverted from the true gospel. And if we're not careful, any of us are susceptible to that kind of corruption and perversion of the Word of God and of the practices of the faith. And Tyndale was an arrow pointing toward heaven because he was called to it. Like every one of us is called to be arrows pointing toward heaven. And we practice a biblical Christian faith thanks to Tyndale's work of translating the Bible accurately into English. And it, it, it continues on to today. Look up Tyndale Bible Publishers or Bible Translation. You know, it's, the work continues today. Peter argues that believers in Jesus have been called to this kind of life. This is one of the very unique points of Christianity. Jesus himself suffered and was sacrificed. What religion, what historic faith has the founder sacrificed his life? Buddha didn't do that. Muhammad didn't do that. Confucius didn't do that. It's Jesus who sacrificed himself, who took on suffering that he didn't deserve for his followers. So they would never have to suffer in that way. But it says, Peter's telling us, he set an example. You don't have to suffer to earn your salvation. You've already got salvation, but make it count. The suffering you're going to endure, be ready. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I think we need to realign our expectations as Christians. The last um, portion is, is, I call it experience, verses 22 and 23. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There's that, Peter's quoting from that verse I quoted from earlier, Striper, Isaiah 53, 5. Peter's quoting from it. By his wounds we have been healed. In another translation, it's by his stripes we are healed. For you were the stripes because he was beaten, his stripes on his back when he was beaten by the, by the whip, by his stripes were healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Man, Christ left us an example. He suffered. Jesus suffered. He went to the extreme of dying on the cross. We just celebrated Easter. We celebrated the resurrection of Christ. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's everything that we need in our lives. 
He's the object of our faith. Success is Jesus. Jesus is success. Go toward Jesus. Point toward Jesus. If you keep your eye on Jesus, your faith will be high. If you keep your eye on Jesus, you'll attempt great things. If you keep pointing to Jesus, you're going to be a great witness for Jesus in a world that so desperately is falling apart and needs Jesus. Needs Jesus. So he was the example for us in his suffering. And I'll just say this. Suffering is not on a hot summer day and your AC breaks down. That's not suffering. Suffering is not when the Wi-Fi goes down in your house. That's not suffering. Those are inconveniences. Jesus committed no sin. There was no theft, no lying, no coveting. Jesus was not lustful. He did not have lustful thoughts. He did not have lustful actions. There was no disobedience to God. Jesus was clean of all sin. All those sins that show themselves in our lives, Jesus was clean of them. But those sins show up in our lives even after we come to faith. While we're pure because we're cleansed when we put our faith in Christ, we're pure and cleansed and holy positionally, from a practical standpoint, we still have sin in us. And we're still susceptible to temptation and falling to those sins. But not Jesus. No deceit was found in his mouth. No revile. He did not revile when others reviled him, it says here. He did not threaten others when he suffered. If you do this to me, I know some people... I could call some angel from heaven. Jesus didn't do that. One time he said, if I wanted to, I could, but I'm not going to. When he was threatened, he did not issue threats back. When he was reviled, he did not revile. Whatever was inflicted on him, he didn't turn back. He didn't give to others. One of the very curious things about Jesus' life is that he didn't own much, yet he never lacked anything. He was not wealthy, yet he shared abundantly. He went through incredible suffering that he did not deserve, and yet we find him full of joy and smiling and generous with his time, instructing others on how they can overcome setbacks. That's what I want for my life. To never lack, to experience complete abundance, to be full of joy, smiling, generous, and wise. Like Jesus. And as we follow Jesus, we become like Jesus. No matter how poor or wealthy, we are wealthy in Christ. We never lack. And, and so, how is this possible? He, Jesus entrusted himself, Peter tells us, to the judge who judges justly. He put his life in his father's hands. That's what Peter, that Peter tells us that Jesus did. Jesus put his life in the hands of the father in heaven, just as Jesus calls us to put our lives in the, our father in heaven, in his hands. We follow in Jesus' steps. We have a curriculum for Christ-likeness. We have a curriculum for Christ-likeness. If we will follow it, if we will use it, if we will jump in and become Christ-like. Christians have a roadmap, and it's Jesus' life. He is our example, our leader, and our commander. When we find, we find that if we will trust Him and follow His example... It will open up possibilities for a good life in our lives today. For freedom from sin today. And for those who follow after us to make their lives better through our lives and our actions. Like Tyndale did in his day. 
You don't even, you didn't, most of you didn't even know who he was, but you're experiencing a freedom from religious tyranny that you don't, that, that, that millions of people were stuck in. But we experience that freedom because of the work that Tyndale did in translating the Bible accurately and putting it in the hands of the people. William Tyndale started something. Like, he took, like, you could, you could like, the, the work of the apostles, and then you go, okay, what's the next major shakeup in the world? William Tyndale's work. Amazing. Amazing. Better is not just, having a better life is not just about material possessions. Having a better life is about true inner goodness, about inner peace, about inner satisfaction. We're, we're talking about the condition of your soul. That's the better that Jesus came to bring us. And so we need to experience Christ and his goodness in every way by following his example. And I just want to say, if, if you really want to change in your life, if you're, if you're stuck and you're not seeing any more trans transformation in your life because it's not just transformation in the early days of being a Christian. We should constantly be transformed into Christ likeness until we're entirely like Christ in every way that a human can be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we should be growing and changing and transforming until the day we die while there's still blood flowing through our veins, while our heart's still beating. We need to be transforming in Christ's likeness. And I'm, I'm telling you that good intentions alone won't get you there. It won't, you, you won't get there by saying, yeah, I want to be like Christ. Yeah, I want to be good. Yeah, I want to be a Christian. I want to live a holy life. I want to do it. Good intentions will not get you there. That sounds good. I'm going to make the change. And then how many people fall off? How many people fall off? I love our, 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 our priesters who were here last week. The room was full last week. But unfortunately, a lot of them fall off. Good intentions fall off. We fall off on the everyday following of Jesus. And there are three things that are necessary if you really want to change. And Jesus modeled them with his disciples. The curriculum for Christ-likeness. There are three things that are entirely necessary if you want to change, see the transformation in your life of your behavior and your attitude and actions. And if these three things aren't part of your life, that's why you're stuck. And the three are these. First, immersion in a plan. Immersion in a teaching. Immersion in Christ's teaching. You have to be immersed into his teaching completely immersed. You can't dabble around with Christianity. You cannot dabble with Christianity. You have to immerse yourself completely into the teachings of Jesus. Start with the Gospels. Do it afresh. You may have read the Gospel many times. Read them again today. Start reading the Gospels. Immerse yourself. I tell new believers, begin with the Gospel of John. It's the most clear picture of Jesus and his life. Immerse yourself. How many times can you read the Gospel of John this week? Read it every day. Read through it by the end of the week. Have it done two or three times, the whole book of the, of the Gospel of John. Immerse yourself in the teachings of Jesus. Second, you need accountability. You can't be a lone ranger and follow Jesus. That's why Jesus had disciples, and he gathered them into groups. And, and even there was... Not really a hierarchy, but he had the 12 among the thousands that were his closest disciples. And even among the 12, he had the three, Peter, James, and John, that, that were his closest disciple that he revealed himself most fully to. And, and um, you have to have accountability amongst others who are believers in the way that you want to change into. You've got to have accountability. What is accountability? That others that you go, you know what? This is where I want to go. Will you help me get there? Will you remind me? Will you hold me accountable when you see me falling off, falling off the path? That's why we have small groups. Small groups are other Christians that we can immerse ourselves into the way of Jesus with and be accountable to each other. A family, if a family is all on track, we can hold each other accountable like a small group. 
but we need to be able to encourage and pray for one another and, 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 and spur each other on toward goodness in the name of Jesus. And we need a coach or a leader. That's why we have group leaders in small groups. We have a group leader that helps us get there. Guys, you can't get there yourself. You can't say like, oh, well, I'll just do it my own way, pastor. You think that you're smarter than Jesus? Jesus already told us the way to do it. You think you're smarter than Jesus? Oh, I don't need to show up for church every week. You think you're smarter than Jesus? Come on. Follow the way of Jesus. He already showed us the way. Don't dabble in church. Don't dabble in Christianity. Don't dabble with Jesus. Don't dabble with your life. Immerse yourself into the way of Jesus. Guys, that's the kind of people I want to go with. Let's go be the church. Let's be that kind of church together. Let's see this city transformed. You go, why doesn't the church have the kind of impact that we want to have? Because we're not living like Jesus. We're dabbling around with the faith. Guys, we're better than that. Don't dabble with the faith. I was done with dabbling with Jesus as a teenager. I was ashamed to tell people I was a Christian. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed to bring it up. But there was a day when I got all in with Jesus and I said, I don't care what they think about me. I'm following Jesus. I don't care if I lose friends because I'm too into Jesus. If my friends don't like me because I'm too into Jesus, then I need to get new friends who like me for who I am. I learned that from Jesus. I learned that from that group Striper. You know that? I learned it from a rock band, a Christian rock band. You could be who you are, and if people don't like it, it's their problem, not your problem. Be who you are in Christ, people. Let's be Christians who make a difference. Let's be Christians who live the life. Stop dabbling with your faith. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. I love you. I'm thankful for each of you, all of you. I go, let's go together. Let's go all in together. Let's not dabble. Let's stop dabbling today and go all in with Jesus. Be on, on your form, David was talking about filling out your form. Put on there, when's, the, when's this next group going to start up? What, what group can I lead? I want to be part of this kind of group, and let's start a new group. We're going to start new groups in a couple of weeks. Man, men's group is going to meet at William's house. William offered his house. He's like, hey, men's group can meet at my house every week in Buena Park. We're getting ready to start that new men's group that's meeting at William's house. I love that. William goes, hey, this is my house. It's my bachelor pad, and I'm offering it to the Lord. I'm offering it to men's group. Let's go do this. Man, thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you. We need more groups meeting in people's homes. It's the most organic when they meet in people's homes. Some of our groups meet at the church office. It's not very organic at the church office. I would invite every group to meet at my house, but nobody wants to drive all the way to Long Beach. But if anybody wants to come to my house in Long Beach, I'll have groups at my I've done it before. And only those we offered in our church, people who want to come meet at a small group that meets at my house, and a handful of people were going like, I'll go to Long Beach. I want to be part of that group. And a bunch of people said, ah, it's too far for me. Ah, it's too far for me. Ah, it's too far for me. <laughs> Suffering for Jesus. Sorry. Marcia, I, I bet you, if I say, Marcia, can we have a group that starts up at our house this week? She'll go, yep, let's do it. But will you come? Will you come to our house every week in Long Beach? Guess what? If we do it at your house, I'll come to your house. That's what I've been doing. That's what I do. I drive here from Long Beach every time I'm here. Every time the church doors are open. Will you open up your house? If you do. Let's have a new group that starts there. Because here's what happens. When you have a group that meets in your house, 
you'll look at it differently and you'll invite different people. If it's in your house, you'll invite your friends and you're going to invite your friends who aren't Christians who you wouldn't invite to something at church. And they're going to come to faith because it's in your house. And if you start opening up your houses and say, okay, we're going to inconvenience ourselves and suffer for Jesus by opening our house every week to have a small group meet there, and you watch, people are going to get saved in your house because you said, I'll open up my house. I want to draw us to a close. Three practical suggestions to be a witness for Jesus. If you want to be a witness for Jesus, I'm going to give you three practical suggestions. And then I'm going to draw us to a prayer. Here are those practical suggestions. To be a witness for Jesus, you need to change your expectations. We need to change our expectations. Our expectations are important because what we expect, that was, that's what we adjust our lives to. That's what we prepare for, what we expect, right? So we set up 70 chairs in here because we expect 60 people to show up or 50 people to show up. We need to change our expectations. If we had a different expectations, we'd put out every chair and we'd stop making such wide gaps, right? But we need to change our expectations as God's people. And here's what I mean. Be willing, change your expectation. Be willing to offend authorities. Be willing to offend your boss. Be willing to offend your teacher. Be willing to offend people who you think will be offended by Jesus. Change your expectation. Because you're a Christ follower. And Christ will offend them. But if they're offended by you preaching Christ, they're not offended by you. They're offended by Christ. So change your expectation and be willing to offend authority. Second thing. When you're talking about Jesus, call for a response with urgency. When you're talking about Jesus, don't just go, yeah, maybe someday you'll come to church, or maybe someday you'll see what I mean about Jesus changing your life. Stop doing that. Don't do that. Instead, call for a response. Hey, would you like to put your faith in Jesus? If not you, then who? If not now, then when? When will you? Because you'll keep putting it off. Do you want to put your faith in Jesus right now? Right now is your moment. Right now is your time. You can find faith in Jesus. You can come alive to Jesus Christ, the maker of the universe, the Lord of all. You can experience life transformation by Jesus, for Jesus, and in Jesus' name, and with his power. And the third thing, expectation that we need to change, is we need to delight in the gospel. We need to delight in the gospel when it's shared and when it's being shared. And we need to delight in the worship that transpires by the, 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 the speaking of the gospel, by delighting in the gospel. If you're delighted by the gospel, you love to worship. You love to worship. You love to worship. You know how it is sometimes, you know, you know what this is like where sometimes you'll notice somebody who's unexpected and they come to faith. It could be a celebrity or a sports figure. And like they come to faith or some kind of influence or somebody who's popular and they come to faith or they talk about Jesus and you're like, did you hear that so-and-so? Did you hear what he said, what she said? They're talking about Jesus. And they actually had, they were like, they were on. They weren't like, like veering from the gospel. They were on the gospel. Why did you get excited about that? It's a good thing. Great. But why would you get excited? Because you love the gospel. And you want to hear the gospel. You're like, you're surprised that somebody who is out there in the public sphere and not in the Christian world, but like talking about Jesus and what's important to you. And you get excited about it, right? You, you love it like when in, in the Grammys, like when somebody gets up and receives a Grammy and they like, Beyonce gets up and she's like, talks about like, thank the Lord or something like that. And you're like, yeah, Wow. 
You're like, whoa, that's just like, you're surprised if somebody like that talks about the gospel. Well, you know what? Let's not look for the scraps of some celebrity preaching the gospel. Let's preach the gospel with our lives. Let's preach the gospel with our lives. Join me in prayer. Our God and our Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you for your love. Jesus, I hope that this message did you justice. I know it went long, and I know I went in some, into some, ter- some territory that probably stepped on toes. But God, I pray, God, that I... I'm okay with offending with the gospel. I don't want to offend with me. Hopefully anything I offended with, it was because I preached the gospel, because I spoke the good news. Lord, I pray that you would draw us close to yourself. Lord, we love you, and we need you. If there's somebody out there in the hearing of this message who has yet to put your faith in Jesus, why not now? Why not now? Why not you? Why not now? And if you want to put your faith in Jesus, just say in the quietness of your heart, Jesus, I want you and I need you in my life. Jesus, I believe you're the Lord of all. And I invite you to be my Lord. Amen. Will you rise with us as we sing?
Amen, amen. Uh, right now, I want to take us into a time of offering. Um, you know, there's been many times in my life where I chose to focus on my lack of money. I chose to worry about how much was in my account, worry about how much I would have to pay for this or pay for that. And I'm going to tell you, each and every one of those times of worrying never made my life any better. The things that have made my life better, the times that have made my life better are the times that I trusted in God. And so I don't know what the reason is if you choose not to give to the Lord, but if it's because you're worrying about money, I can tell you that you're probably not in a place where he's going to do with you what he needs or what he wants from you. And I can remember being a college student, being really broke, um, and I just did some side work for some businesses right by my college. Uh, and I, I, don't, I forget what it was. I think I was like loading up some bricks into a truck or something like that. And I made, I don't know, 200 bucks that day. And I went to a service later on that weekend um, it was a young adult service, and they were asking for offerings for a missions trip they're going to do for Mexico. And I just felt God like, hey, like, go ahead and give that money that you made to, for that missions trip. And I was like, really? Like, really? And he's like, yeah. And so I went and I gave that $200 for that missions trip. And um, later on that week, I didn't have enough to pay for my books. And I was like, okay, uh, I'm going to try to see if I can get these books online or, like, borrow from people or I don't know, whatever. And uh, one of my dad's friends from San Francisco, I went to my mailing room and I had a letter. And it was from one of my dad's friends in San Francisco. Him and his wife gave me a $500 check to buy my books. And from that moment on, I've chosen never to worry about money. Not because of some circumstance like something's just going to always give me more than I gave or I'm giving so that something will give back to me but because I felt God in both instances say give and I felt God in the other instance say I'm blessing you my son so when you're giving right now give with that spirit give with that spirit of trusting God not worrying about where that money could go to in your life just let it go. <clears throat> so there's two ways that you can give. Um, we have, if you're here in person, you go get a give in that uh, metal box in the back by my mom. Or you can give online at victoryanheim.org and click the donation tab. And you can set up a one-time gift or you can give weekly. If you have not started giving, then we would invite you to go ahead and take the 90-day challenge. And that's to test God by giving for 90 days and seeing what happens with your life. Now I'd love to close out today. It's been great to be together. And if you've put your faith in Jesus, then we would love if you could go ahead and tell us. So in your response form, go ahead and write it down. Give us your information. We'd love to get in contact with you and, and take some next step with you as you, as you go on this journey. Um, and online, you can fill out a form online, and we can uh, be in contact you, with you that way. With that said, I'm going to close this out today with this blessing. Our church is called Victory Anaheim. We're called Victory because we are choosing together to live in the victory that God gave us when he died on the cross and rose again on that third day like we celebrated last week. We can celebrate that every single day and live in that victory every single day. So when you go out these doors right now, don't keep what we talked about. Don't keep what we learned today in your heart. Yes, keep it in your heart, but don't only keep it in your heart. Share it with your people at your work, with people in your family. Go out today and live victoriously because Christ was victorious for us. Go out, church, and be blessed. Thank you so much for coming. Love you guys.